wonderful name it is. Come on, sing. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of I want you just to lift your voice and offer a sacrifice of praise to him. Come on, lift your voice to the Lord. If you love him, tell him. If he's worthy, tell him. Come on, let's offer up our praise to him. Lord Jesus, we love you. We worship you, Lord. We bless your name, oh God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, there's no one like you, Lord. Jesus, this is all for you, Lord. Our praise is all for you. Our hearts are all for you. Our love is all for you, Lord Jesus. We bless you tonight. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that as we worship you, the walls fall down all around us. We thank you that every barrier is broken as we worship you, Lord. We thank you for the release of the fragrance of your presence, Lord, tonight. Be glorified in this place, Lord. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But I hear the Lord saying that even as you have poured out your worship to me, I'm pouring in my love to you. As you broke your box and you gave your heart and you gave your worship to me and the fragrance filled the room I found the empty place in you and I began to fill it the Lord said I'm seeking out that emptiness I'm seeking out that place that is waiting for me and I'm filling it says the Lord I'm going to fill it strong I'm going to fill it deep I'm going to fill it good I'm going to fill you to overflowing and I'm going to wash away the discouragement I'm going to wash away the fear and the tension and the anxiety and the stress of the old season, even that place where you were stuck and limping and hurting. The Lord said, tonight's a night of healing. Tonight's a night where you're finding your place. Tonight's a night where I'm pouring into the emptiness and I'm replacing the depression. I'm replacing the sorrow and the grief, even the grief that has choked you and suffocated you. I'm breaking the spirit of grieving and I'm taking away mourning and I'm giving you joy and I'm giving you beauty for ashes. Now receive my love even, even as you have given me yours. The Lord says, I'm pouring into you. I'm giving you fresh commission in my presence. Wasn't it in my presence where Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. Wasn't it in that moment that I gave him fresh vision? Receive my vision, receive my love. And allow me to lift you on your feet, says the Lord, for I have much for you to do, says the Lord your God. Hallelujah. How many will just receive that tonight? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, if you're going to give a clap for the Lord, let's just clap for him. For the Lord says, as you continue to worship me in this season, this is not just for one night, says God. It is for a season. And I am coming to change even the atmosphere in my house and even in this nation, says the Lord. I'm coming to actually change the atmosphere. And the pressure will be reduced from my people, says the Lord, and placed upon the satanic forces that have put pressure against you. I'm reversing the course of things in this hour, says God, and I'm going to cause even my cloud of glory to continually manifest, for I'm bringing even a people back to the supernatural, says the Lord. I'm bringing my bride back to a supernatural existence, says God. What will be the difference between you and those that don't know me? It will be my presence, says the Lord, and I'm going to cause the signs, wonders, and miracles to take place in the midst of my body even this night says the spirit of the lord the healing anointing is here now touch the places on your body believe for the miraculous see in your heart and with your eyes into the spirit realm and i promise you i will bring many healings even in this meeting yes they'll be undocumented says the lord there'll be so many as the meetings go forward even in my nation that people will not remember how many of them are but they will remember that a cloud showed up and my glory 
spirit was in it and my worshipers have walked into that cloud and as you've entered that cloud through worship I will manifest my glory and my presence even tonight the gift of healing is being released into many of the pastors here your services are not just supposed to be about preaching a sermon but they're supposed to be about signs and wonders also and healing says the Lord healing for the signs and wonders follow the word and now I will say to you follow the blueprint the apostolic blueprint says the Lord that my word will be preached with power but then there will come a time and a moment in your time where the power of the Lord was present to heal and you will know that moment and you will step into it and miraculous things will take place says the Lord there's a miracle tonight I have to do this right now I've got to do this and this is very unique the Lord says that you have traveled near and far and you've gone through the seas and the oceans with your husband. And I saw you uh, traveling with him and you've heard every message and you know the greatness of the gift of God. But the Lord says, I want you to be even that counterpart, says the Lord. I want you to be the one that heals my people. Would you stretch out your hands just like this? Because God says tonight, I give you a healing anointing. The gift of healing is going to manifest in your hands because you say to yourself, what can I do? What can I do? Yes, the Lord knows you sing, you play, but the Lord also wants you to heal pastors and heal pastors' wives, says the Lord. And by the touch of these fingers, even as I've used your hands and your fingers to stroke the keys, to bring melodies into the atmosphere, to heal atmospheres and to change them into glorious transformational atmospheres, so I will now use these hands, says God, to even heal the sick. And you will touch the those that have been bruised and battered and rejected and neglected and forgotten says the Lord and your touch will be gentle and your touch will be powerful and I will release electricity in the spirit through these hands and many will be healed of even things growing in their bodies tumors and growth will dissolve even uh, depression will cease even fear and anxiety will bow and melt at the touch of these hands and the speaking of your word so as you are with your husband says the Lord in these days that come I now name you the dynamic duo says the Spirit of God come on hallelujah hallelujah what's happening is God is coming near us he loves he loves it when we worship him he loves it when we come together as a family and he's drawing near us right now and I'm telling you if you need something from the Lord you need to receive it right now because he's here if you need healing, just lift your hands. If you need, if you've been in grief or sorrow or brokenness or stuck or whatever it is, Lord, we just release your mighty presence. Thank you for loving us so strong. Thank you for being so good all the time, even when we don't deserve it, Lord, even when we feel far away from you. Lord, you're coming close to us. You're pursuing us tonight with your love. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We reverence you, Lord. And I thank you for meeting every need in this room and answering every question in this room and releasing every heart in this room. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Just be, just be seated. I feel the presence of the Lord so strong. I want, it's time for the word. I, we had other things we were gonna do, but the Holy Spirit is here and uh, we'll do it after. I wanna introduce to you one of my favorite speakers in all the world. Uh, I respect him as, you know, a leader in my life. He's the chairman of MFI, Ministers Fellowship International, which uh, Gateway is a proud member of, and he's been a blessing to churches and movements all over the world. But it's not his intellectual strength. It's his father's heart, and it's the wisdom that flows out of him, and he has made a major impact on Gateway and on myself and on Kathy, and we love both Frank and Sharon DiMazio, they are dear and precious to us, and we are so honored that they would come to be with us. So I want you to stand to your feet, please, and let's give a gateway welcome to Dr. Frank DiMazio as he comes. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming, Pastor Frank. I don't know, this isn't the right table. This isn't the right table. This isn't the right table. Okay, we're going to get the right table. Let's get the right table. It's out. Yeah, yeah, that's a lower, there's a lower table. First few minutes, you can do it without a table. How was your flight down? We got here this time. 
<laughs> How many remember last year where he didn't, he was, the, he was the missing ingredient, but now he's here. Give him another hand. God bless you. Perfect. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> what a great group of people. and Kind of like uh, coming home again. I come here so much. Uh, I don't know why David keeps inviting me back, you know. It's just you've, you've heard me already. You, and I, I could maybe prophesy this time, oh, though, yeah. and do something different. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, invitation to come here from David and Kathy uh, is important to me. Important because uh, I'm very, I'm very much um, careful where I put my time because I, I have to be very specific nowadays. Uh, and so every invitation, everything I look at, I look at investment. I look at who's carrying what's going to happen, and the church is being built, and can we build it? Uh, and so when David and Kathy ask me to come every time, I always feel it's seed sown on good ground. And uh, the good ground of integrity. You can't really have better ground than integrity. And uh, David and Kathy, they represent integrity of leadership. Come on, give them a hand tonight. Uh, <clears throat> if I hold the mic down about right there and you can adjust the feedback or whatever, will that work for you? So I, I don't want to, I, I, won't, I won't do it. I mean, I'm just, I'm just telling you, it's going to fluctuate. Uh, and, you know, when I'm looking at the notes. And so I'm going to ask you to have a miraculous way of doing this with me, <laughs> that you will follow the Holy Spirit of the living God. <laughs> When I go loud, you go and you, I mean, you're just going to make this happen. It's already better. It's a miracle. It's a sovereign act of God. <laughs> Thank you very much. But it's good to be here with the church and also with my good friend, uh, prophet, pastor, uh, Eric Butler, who is just uh, um, amazing. I've always envied Eric because, I mean, he's a great preacher. He's a great singer. He's a great pastor. He's a great prophet. He's a, he's a great everything. You know, with me, I just, I have one of the five, so I get to speak. And, and if it doesn't go well, I, I can't prophesy my way out of it, you know. I can't, I can't go off on something. I got to stay, I got to stay with it, you know. Eric, he can just kind of sing you into the anointing, preach you into the anointing, pray you into the anointing, prophesy you into the anointing. When you leave, you say, who was that man? That's uh, Eric. And then you have, has, has Jerusha been here before? Yeah. No, today uh, today's your first time here, Jerusha. Jerusha I've known since she was born. Uh, her parents and I uh, go all the way back. Actually, Sharon roomed with her mother in Bible college, and Jess was in Bible college same time I was. And so we went through college together. We got married almost at the same time. Uh, we only lived a, a block or two apart during college. And uh, then Jess went to pastor, and I went to teaching at the college, and all of our years, you know, that we've known the family. And uh, my son is very close to uh, Jess's son, and they're both pastoring new churches. And Jerusha is uh, really, really an anointed woman of God. Uh, she's one of the best young preachers I've heard in a very long time. And uh, we have her at our conference. And come on, give her a hand. Tell her. Yes, 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 you are. You're, you're, you're an awesome young woman, and you have the gift uh, to preach. And she has the gift to study, uh, study, study. So she doesn't just you know, throw out a few little feeble seeds. She throws out some good stuff. You know? she, she's a disciplined book person. And uh, I think that is a wonderful thing, too. OK, uh, I think if you could somehow turn my mic down a little bit, maybe, or my feedback up here, or maybe. I don't need to hear myself so loud, but maybe that's up here. I'm not trying to tell you. I told you it's a miracle. You run it as the Holy Spirit. But I'm helping the Holy Spirit now, just, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, and I'm very sorry. It, it, it'll kind of be weird, because I won't hold it right to my 
Yeah, I'll hold it closer if you turn me down up here because it sounds so loud to me when I put it real close to me. And so it just, uh, if you could fix that, that would be a wonderful thing. If not, uh, you will be judged by God. And, uh, if, if this message doesn't go well, it's right there. It is right there. I got to go somewhere with it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Forgive me, brother. We can have communion. With, and I'll even do real wine with you. No, not really. Okay. Um, great word over my wife. Maybe she can uh, get this gift cooked up. She's had some uh, healings in her life. Uh, you know, she's had a couple miraculous miracles as a child. She was healed. And a few other times, uh, of course, she had to get healed to marry me. Uh, and so she has had the miraculous. And so I take that word, Eric, and that's an awesome thing. And uh, if something else comes up, I, I wouldn't mind a little bit either, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, just, just saying, you know, if something else pops up in your mind. Uh... Okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, where's my clock? At 7.38 is real time, right? Yeah, that's real time. And so, do I have another clock? I'm, I'm looking for something else that tells me. Okay, well, do you tell me. No, you tell me when it gets time. Because... Well, if you don't, it could be 9.15. So, I, honestly, when I start speaking, uh, a lot of times I get in my own zone, but I forget about time. And it's not just saying trying to get more time out of you. I actually uh, just zone in and I forget. And, and the clocks all over the world speed up when I speak. <laughs> You know, they go faster. Everywhere I speak, the clocks go faster. I've watched it, you know. It's horrible when you're really into it and you look up and there's seven minutes left and you've not even started your message. You know, that's a bad feeling right there. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to go to the book of Revelation. I'd like you to go with me. And we're going to read from the book of Revelation. And I'm going to start with Revelation chapter 1. And uh, we're going to read a few verses, and I want to uh, highlight some things uh, within this chapter that I'm going to kind of pull out and use as a foundation of what I'm going to say to you. I feel very good about what I'm going to do. I feel it's a right word uh, for your church and for this time and this conference, and uh, I'll let you judge that by the time we finish. Uh, but Revelation is about the book of Revelation, obviously, from chapter 4 on, is about all the heavy stuff. So I'm not doing all the visions and the, you know, the seven trumpets, seven vials and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into the book of Revelation. I'm going to get into the first chapter just a little bit because I want to uh, acknowledge something biblically that's taken place in this particular book that's going to take place and should take place in the body of Christ all the time. And uh, I want to kind of pull that out and show you as I build the platform for where I'm going to go with this word. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Remember, John is the last of the 12 to die. John is an old man. John is the writer of the Gospel of John. He's the writer of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he's the writer of the book of Revelation. John is the revelator. John is now uh, living his last years out on the Isle of Patmos. The Isle of Patmos is actually facing uh, Asia Minor where these seven churches are. So he's right off the coast of Asia Minor, and he's going to give a word to these seven cities, and these seven cities are lined up. And so John's an old man. He's been stoned. He's been beat. He's been boiled in oil. Uh, he's been persecuted. Uh, he has been left there to die. That's where the, the people that were uh, never going to return, they would send them to Patmos, and they would die in Patmos. That's where you'd be buried. And uh, so John is there. He's an aged apostle. And it's interesting because John has no church to go to. John has no other apostles around him. John might have had some disciples that ended up there with him by choice to try to help the elderly gentleman, but we don't know that. But John has the Holy Spirit. And the whole thing is about him and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit on the Lord's Day. He was in the Spirit, and it's all about that. So this particular book of the Bible is one of the 
uh, most debated books of the Bible because of the way John wrote it and because of the material in it. Um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation, the opening, the apocalypse, that, that uh, unveiling is what it means, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. I, I want you to notice the progression here, that God gave him this word to show his servants. What servants? Well, it's going to be later on the leadership. The leadership servants that are leading churches and involved with churches are the servants that he's talking about here. And things that must come to pass, things must, which must shortly, I want you to write the word down shortly, because this is 2,000 years ago, it gives you some idea of God's calendar. Uh, so when God says it's going to come to pass shortly and you get a prophecy from Eric, just understand that's 2,000 years right there. Uh, and so it, it's, not, it's not one of these quick fulfilled things. Things which must shortly come to pass. It's humorous to me. And he sent and signified it by the angel to his servant John. And so John received the writings by an angel. So John received the revelation through angelic visitation and angelic visitation through and also the Holy Spirit by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. I want you to just circle or write down he saw. And so the words he writes, he first sees the words before he writes the words down. So it's the words that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. I think there's a blessing just in reading the book of Revelation out loud and understand nothing. Don't have to. But if you read it, there's a blessing just to hear it. So if you've never read the book of Revelation out loud, right through chapter 21, you should do it. And, and you will find the Holy Spirit come upon you. There will be impartation. There will be explanation. There will be things that will happen. Because it says in your Bible, there is a blessing to those who read that book, this book right here, and hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Verse 4. John, now I want you to put this down. <coughs> John, to the seven churches. I want you to say out loud with me, to the seven churches. <laughs> so, so you know this, but I'm getting somewhere on my, on my focus here. So he's writing to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from, notice, seven churches and from the seven spirits. So you have seven churches and you have seven spirits. What seven spirits? Are they ever identified? Are they ever listed? Is it one spirit per church because there are seven churches, seven spirits? Who are the seven spirits? What are the seven spirits? Are there seven aspects of the Holy Spirit working in the seven churches? When it says, it says in your Bible, you've got to ask the question, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And has made us kings and priests. One of the greatest themes of New Testament in teaching is that he's made us kings and he's made us priests. Both of which are going to be developed in the book of Revelation. Because all the kings fall one at a time. All the way through the whole world history, every king will fall. But there's one king who will never fall, who will rule and reign. And his name is Jesus. And that's the king we're building up to. So all earthly kings, their crowns fall off their heads. But the crown on Jesus' head will never fall. He's the king of kings. He's the king of every ruler in the planet. And when you get concerned about Turkey and all, man, it's kind of funny that the seven churches I'm talking about is originally in Turkey. So that's the country they were in. And we're having all this trouble. If those churches would evangelize better, we wouldn't have the trouble we have right now. Okay. <laughs> Behold, verse 7, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, which are the people who put him on the cross and all the tribes of the earth and mourn because of him, even so I'm in. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation of the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, which is the island of death, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, first and last, what you see, write in a book. Notice, I want you to put this one verse down, 
And if you can, just write it out. I want you first and first and last, what you see, I want you to write it in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Only one church did not get rebuked. What about Jerusalem and Antioch? Why aren't they in the list? Why, why aren't they in the list of the greatest churches that the greatest message that would ever be been given in the history of mankind? The two founding apostolic churches was Jerusalem and Antioch. And neither one make the list. But the third one that does, that was the mighty church, was Ephesus. That's where Timothy pastored. And Paul writes his epistles about what he's doing there. And he left them there to him in the pastor. So Ephesus, the reason is these seven cities are on the... Uh, commerce track of trade in that day. So if you go through the map, you'll find these seven cities lined up, and it was called the circular trade route. The circular trade route, because if you go to one city, you could circle around that city and actually do business with 10 more cities, and then go to the next city and circle around and do business with 20 more cities, and go to the next city. And so they were all hub cities. They were all hub cities. And so the word that goes to the seven churches are not just to the seven churches. They represent all churches that would receive this word and all churches that would actually hear the word. They, these seven are representative of what the churches needed to hear. Ephesus, which was a great apostolic church, did a lot of apostolic things, but they left their first love. And then you start with them with Smyrna. Uh, they were faithful, but they also had weakness. Then you go down to Thyatira, and they compromised, and Pergamos compromised, and the false prophets came. Every one of them had kind of apostolic problems, and so the word comes to them, and the Holy Spirit speaks to them, and before you know it, uh, there's a correction with some of them, but ultimately, those seven cities with those seven main churches did not exist 100 years from that letter. 100 years from that letter, those churches didn't exist. They had no power, no influence, and they didn't take us into the third century Christianity. They fell by the wayside. Ephesus itself became almost as bad as Laodicea. And so something was going on in the mind of God as he spoke. Now, this is where I'm headed in this word tonight uh, and talking about the seven churches. And then it talks about the seven stars, the seven spirits, the seven candlesticks, all in the same chapter. And so you have these sevens that keep popping up. The, the seven churches are the seven candlesticks. They have seven stars, which is the anglios, the messengers over the church, and the seven spirits. And so this word is coming in these sevens about these churches that are going to receive a word. Now, I want to uh, give you a word to the church, not to the individual. I'm talking tonight about the church. And I wonder sometimes that people get really excited about prophecy over themselves as much as they get excited about prophecy over the church. Or eager to find your destiny yourself, are you just as eager to find the destiny for the church? Or are, you, are you eager to be a person of favor and blessing and prosperity and, and you want God to speak to you and you come to church and you leave and you go back to life and you go... But what happens when God actually speaks to the church? And when God speaks to the church, are you just as eager to hear the word to the church as you are to the individual? Because Christianity today has become individualistic. It has become consumeristic. It's become what's in it for me? What is God going to say to me? And if you say to the congregation, hey, we're going to have prophets tonight, and anybody could get prophesied, you might pack the place out because everybody wants a personal prophecy. If you say we're going to have church tonight and God's going to speak to the whole congregation and God's going to give us something where we're going, you might have half the church come because they're not going to get the personal word. They're not going to get the word they want. They're not going to get the blessing they want. But I'm telling you right now, Christianity, where it sits right now, we need the word of the Lord to come to the churches again. We need God to speak to the churches. We need God to come to the churches. We need the seven spirits to gang up on us. We can't deal with just one spirit or two spirits. We need all seven. We need the entire power of the Holy Spirit to come upon the churches. Can I hear an amen? So, I'm going to give you what I call the making of a church's mantle. 
the making of a church's mantle. Every church has one. Now, I'll define it in a little bit. But first, I'm going to give you three sections of points. Some will come on the slides. My first point is churches have God-planned destinies. Okay, this is my first big point. Roman numeral one, if you're outlining, it's my first Roman numeral, but and then there's going to be four points under this, and there will be slides for the ones I'm going to give you. But the first thing that I want you to categorize is that God has plans and destinies for churches just like he does individuals. And the plan is laid out, and there's four things that help you find your destiny as a church. First, we know the church destiny is what? Rooted in the relationship that the church has with the Lord. And if there's no fresh revelation of Jesus in the church and you haven't built an altar of relationship, I'm simply saying in this point right here, if Jesus is not the center, the church will never find how far to go with the perimeters. And so we, we come back to this main thing that Christianity needs today. Uh, we are so into copying everything. We're so into finding so much in the secular organizations and so much in the books that are in secular leadership. We're so much into what the world thinks about leadership, what the world thinks about everything. And we kind of copy it, we paint it up, and we hang the Holy Spirit on some of it, and we call it good. But in, in building the church that I'm talking about with the destinies that we're going to have to have, I would say that the altar needs to move from the outside to the inside, from the perimeter to the core. We need to get perfect prayer back, intercessory prayer, Holy Spirit prayer. We need worship that moves people. We need to understand that unless Jesus is in the house, the house is empty. Doesn't matter how many people are in the house. It doesn't matter how many programs you can pull off. It doesn't matter how much you can brag about how you serve the city and you feed the poor and you do this and you do that. But there's been people doing that that are non-Christian organizations. Feeding the poor does not bring Jesus back, although it's a good kind thing to do. And I think the church should be involved with every kind of people there are. I, I would preach that and I would own that and I did that. But I want you to understand feeding the poor without Jesus as the center is just feeding the poor. That's all it is. Organizing to have the best kind of staff without Jesus as the center is not a church that will reach its destinies. We're not hiring people because of their resume. We're hiring people because of their encounter with Jesus. Their encounter with Jesus. We hire them because they know how to build an altar for us. We hire them because they can lead us to that altar. The church destiny is in the altar. Second, we know supernatural empowering of the church happens when the church is what? Rooted in the Holy Spirit. So if we're rooted in the Holy Spirit, a love for the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, moving in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is again centered to everything we do. We know that the, the destiny of the church is in the Holy Spirit. It's not in my talent. It's not in my great preaching. It's not, I, I know some great churches right now that have great destinies and they have crummy preachers. It's not the preaching. It's not the program. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the power of the Holy Spirit has to be allowed. It has to be recognized. It has to be made room for so that the Holy Spirit will come. Third, we know that the character of the church is ultimately what determines the influence of the church. I've known some very powerful churches that had powerful influence, but because they had cracks in their character, they lost their influence. And I've watched them come decade after decade. I've watched some mighty churches move in and become mighty churches, and those mighty churches have not been able to really keep that mighty going because the power of the Holy Spirit rests on purity. And when there's mixed motives, pride, arrogance, and the world's way, the world's thinking, and the world's thought, and sometimes the world's morals, 
And we still expect the power of God to speak to us, even though we have people doing funny things from the top to the bottom, from the least to the greatest, from the pastor to the staff. I'm not talking about this church, but I'm talking about in America. We have a lot of funny churches that are doing funny things. Why? Because we don't respect the character that the church needs to have. We will sacrifice character for success. We will buy success, even if it destroys people. Even if it hurts your marriage, hurts your kids, hurts your health, hurts your mental health, we will get everything we can from you. And like a styrofoam cup, when we're done with you, we'll crumble you up and throw you away because we don't care about you. We're not pastoring with integrity. We're not pastoring with character. We're not caring for the people of God. We're not caring for the young people and the young marrieds and et cetera. And so we have a lot of churches that are destroying people and yet they have influence, but I'll tell you right now, prophesy with my eyes open, the influence is short-lived. Yeah. Yeah. It's short-lived. Right. Right. And then the world goes, wow, that, wow, that church is gone. He did what? I cannot believe that. It's been going on for how long? Two years. Unbelievable. Thousands of people on television, radio, writing books. I mean, filling places. You, you would look and think, now, maybe we should copy them. Before you copy something, make sure you're copying something that has a God character piece in it. Before you stamp it as where you're going, make sure there's integrity as the root, not manipulation as the fruit. Test it. Test it. I'm convinced. And with my conviction, it's in my mouth, and I'll say it. I'd rather have a small platform with character than a big platform with no character. But a lot of young churches and young preachers and people are selling out for a bigger platform, even though their character can't handle it. They can't go there, but they'll go there anyway. They know they have problems, but they push the envelope, thinking, but my influence is so great. Nobody. Nobody will ever leave me. I remember as a young leader when I watched Jimmy Swaggart on television and repent. Nothing about you know, trying to judge him. I'm just saying it was a fact. He had a problem. He got in, on the television. And I knew the people, some two of the pastors that were involved the whole process. And, and one of the things that was said in the process is the people will never turn on you. The people will never turn on you. You're too popular, you're too big. Be honest, just repent, tell the people, and go on, and your ministry will not be hurt. But the problem with that counsel is it's wrong. And if I'm God, I'm going to hide that man's sin because I don't want everybody to be hurt worldwide. I would hide it. I would do something else. I would, I would try to get him cleaned up in a private place maybe. I wouldn't expose it. But God is not that way. God knows that if he exposes something like that, he saves the people in the long run. If he lets it go, they reproduce after their kind. Wow. And that happened. So when he got up, he cried. He did it all. I mean, I'm not making fun of the man, honestly. I'm just saying. And the church said, we're done with you. Are you kidding me? No. Yes, I forgive you in Jesus' name, but we're like, no, you shouldn't be a leader. You shouldn't be a pastor. You shouldn't be leading anything. You're, you're, a, you're a problem. You're a double-minded man. You're unfaithful. No, I'm not going to fall. The church turned on him in 10 minutes. His finance fell through the bottom. His meetings went every which way. Nothing happened. And that man, I hate to maybe be talking about it. I don't even know if I should, but it just came out. So, you know, <laughs> it came out, you know. My point is, you can't violate what God establishes just to get what you want. Not in business and not in church. Holiness for David is holiness for you. Purity of motive is purity of motive. If we don't get tons of people in because we're not pulling rabbits out of hats, <laughs> we're not putting everybody in the front row and lengthening their leg. Everybody, I can lengthen your leg. Come up and I'll pull it out. 
Nothing proven, nothing happens. It's just a, a lot of strange things that goes on in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Spirit. It doesn't build the church. It gives us a black eye. I think it's time for us to understand that if the church is going to have influence, we have to have biblical character. Yeah. Nothing less from top to bottom. We don't lie. We don't cheat. We don't exaggerate. We don't increase the numbers when they're, it's not there. We don't make the church think that we are filthy rich and things are just going fantastic when we're in the red and going downhill quick. No, what the church needs is some honest, vulnerable, integrity-driven leaders that will allow God to build the church. And when God builds a church, I guarantee you one thing that will not happen is personality worship. God will not just exalt a man. He exalts a church. Yes. Church. Okay. Are you there? Yeah. If, if you think this is too hard, I'm just using Eric's notes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to put them on eBay, you. <laughs> come on, how many are getting something out of this? Yeah. How, how many are saying, God help us build good churches? Yeah. Enduring, longevity churches? The fourth thing is we know that each church has its own, and, and this is, I park and go from here. This is my diving board for the next piece its own unique destiny, unique personality, dominant distinctives derived from heritage and unique mantle. Now, we'll park there, pay the meter for a couple minutes, and look at this. Every church has unique destiny, which means you can't franchise destiny. Every church has unique personality. Why? Because the seven spirits get involved. That's why. There's not just one kind of characteristic of the Holy Spirit. It's multi-characteristics. Dominant distinctives. Hopefully they're biblical. Derived from a heritage. Church has a heritage. Your church, I'm speaking to Gateway Church, and everybody else, every pastor, if you're <coughs> from a different place, <coughs> you can apply all of what I'm going to say. But I am zeroing in on Gateway. That you have a unique destiny, a unique personality, a dominant distinctive, several distinctives, and you have a heritage. And because of that, you have a unique mantle. And that's what I'm talking about tonight. The mantle. The mantle, all right? My first category was Roman number one, if you're taking it that way, was churches have God-planned destinies. My second is churches have God-made mantles. So God-planned destinies and then he puts a mantle on you to fulfill a destiny. The mantle in Scripture is absolutely significant, powerful concept. The mantle God makes for people, individuals, and leaders, I understand that. He also makes mantles for churches. When God puts the mantle on an individual, he doesn't tell you the price tag. Because the price tag is never paid in one season. It's going to take seasons to pay the price. And if you knew the price, you might say, I'm not going into that desert. <laughs> no, 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 no. I rebuke you, devil. I don't do deserts. I don't do deserts. Pain, pain. I rebuke you, devil. Pain is not. I believe in the cross and the healing power and the blood of Jesus. And I rebuke all pain. Rebuke all you want. But First Peter says it's coming. That's what it says. Anybody that tells you anything else, that's a lie. Because 
The Bible is right. The Bible says there is no glory without suffering. There is no mantle without seasons. And there's no seasons without pain. And there's no pain without trials. And there's no trials without paying the price. And some churches simply don't want to pay the price. I want to hire in successful people to make me successful. I'm not going to pay the price to raise them up. And by the way, one of them might be an Absalom, and God knows I don't need an Absalom to come in and, and, you know, just, you know, take my people and take my leaders and take my money and take my car and the country western movement, you know, taking everything. And so you have these Absalom people. Well, I'll tell you right now. If you're going to lead, there's at least... One out of 12 chances, one's a Judas. <laughs> now, Jesus is the model. Everyone teaches that. He's the model. I want 12 disciples. Hello, hello, hello. Did you just say you want 12? I want 11. I don't want 12. Because that 12th one is a problem. So if you're going to lead... You're going to have a Judas. You're going to have an Absalom. You're going to have someone who gets close enough to really hurt you. Not just kind of hurt you, really hurt you. Supernaturally hurt you. <laughs> you get so deeply offended and hurt in ministry and leading. Sometimes it doesn't matter if you're a senior pastor, social pastor, music, or small group leader, whatever, whatever, as you help lead the church. There's going to be some pain and some suffering and there's going to be some seasons and there's going to be some people that are absent and some people that are going to actually take a lot more than they'll ever give you and they're going to talk about you and they're going to take and they're going to take and they're going to take. Remember all the description about King Saul and, and when the people said, okay, we want a king, God says, not a good idea, not a good idea. They said, we want to be like all the other nations, not a good idea. We want a king, okay? Okay, I'll give you a king. Now, remember this. If you keep bugging God, he'll give you what you ask. <laughs> and then he says to the people, okay, I, I'll give you a king. But remember this. He will take your children. He will take your money. He will take your livestock. He will take your vineyards. He will take your land. It's in your Bible. He's a taker. Kings are takers because they build their own kingdoms. And so you want a king after the other nation. No, you, you don't even ask for a king after my own heart. My kind of a king, my kind of a leader. You just want one like the other nations. The other nations have carnal kings. They, they serve themselves. They, 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 they do everything for themselves. If you want a king, I'm going to give you one, but he's going to take everything from you. Why didn't God just not give him Saul and start with David? Why didn't God not let Ishmael ever be born and just start with Isaac? Why, why did he... Why does God let some weird people get born? <laughs> if I was God, I would stop it right there. Nope, no, nope, go back. Go back. God lets people in your life to help you develop the ability, the capacity, the trustworthiness to carry the mantle of God. If you can't get over offenses, just attend church and bring communion with you every Sunday. Get your own jug of wine, loaf of bread, come every Sunday. Just... <laughs> Brother, what a week! What a week. <laughs> the church doesn't do communion, doesn't matter. Get your jug, get your loaf, just take it. Oh, I was so hurt this week. Another week of being here. I need more. I need more. If you're going to be in the church, you're going to need more. And the more is you're going to need more of Jesus that forgives and moves on, doesn't park on the hurt, and doesn't waste your sorrows. Or waste your pain. If I was God, I would have said to Paul, what's the problem? The thorn. The thorn. Yeah, the thorn of my flesh. Well, I, I, I gave it to you. I, I want you to take it away. <laughs> Why? Because I can do so much more without that thorn. 
Some people say the thorn was blindness. Some people say the thorn was other health issues. Some people say the thorn was a demonic power. You choose any one of them. Which one are you going to? No, I want the demonic power. I'll take that one. <laughs> no, I want to be blind. I want to be blind. That's what I want to do. I want to. I mean, all of the choices are bad. <laughs> Is that right? I'm telling you the truth. And if I was God, and I have Paul with a PhD, the ability to write and travel, and he's the, he's the most amazing apostle of anybody, and that guy asked me for anything, I'm going to do it. God says, Paul, if I do it, I'll cheat the process. Oh. What? I'll cheat you from the best piece of your mantle. Oh, wow. What is that? Strength comes out of weakness. Wow. So what is Paul? And this is why he is the man and was the man. He said, so send the weakness. Because when I am weak, yeah, then I am strong. Yeah. We all want strength at any cost and God says don't. Let your dysfunctionality, your brokenness, and your weakness, and your problem be a help for you to be humble and to be more understandable and to be an open door to other people. Don't let your weaknesses be taken from you. If somebody tried to count you out of all your baggage, stop them and say, I'm going to keep that bag. I just need... I don't want to be perfect. You, you think, I'm not preaching to you Bible. I'm preaching to you Bible. I'm just clothing it in ways that you'll grasp me. Joseph got a mantle. Elijah got a mantle. And I have a whole teaching that could be a book on how leaders find, develop, and gain the mantle. I'm talking about the church mantle. And this is what I think is interesting in Genesis 37 and verse 3, where it says, Joseph was loved by Israel more than any other child. Well, that's a formula for destruction. You read any parent book, you can't love one child above another. It says in my Bible, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Does God have favorites? Yep. And I am one of them. <laughs> and you are one of them through Christ, through the cross. And it says that Israel loved him so much. Genesis 37, 3. He made him a tunic. It's the mantle. But it adds only in this scripture, only in this scripture, coat of many colors. So when he brought that coat of many colors, black, blue, red, gray, brown, orange, all the colors, Joseph put on and said, Oh, Dad, wow, thank you for this coat of many colors but we understand the coat was prophetic. Yeah. We understand that the many colors were many seasons. Yeah. And there's a black season, and there's a yellow season, and there's a red season, and there's a brown season, and there's that time of gray where you're misunderstood, a time of darkness and loneliness. And what he was handing Joseph was not the mantle in perfection. He was handing Joseph the mantle in process. Yeah. Joseph put it on. Oh, wow. I love this mantle. And God's saying, you, you better love it a lot, boy, because you're 17 and it's going to be 13 years of changing colors. And the first color is going to be green. Is that right, David? What's green? That's right. Oh, I love this green color. It's so bright. God says, yeah. It's bright, and that it represents something really 
heart. What would that be? All your brothers are going to hate you and envy you, throw you in a pit with no water, then sell you down the road, and you're going to go to a prison. Then, I mean, every color was a season. You want to wear the mantle? Now, remember, okay, I just, re- I just realized it's 815, and I'm on page one, you know. Uh, it's my, it's my destiny. It's, I'll take a little bit. I won't, I won't abuse you, uh, unless God might want to. Yeah, and I think the Lord might want to. You know, he wants to deal with your perfectionism and your, you know. <laughs> Whoops! Whoops! That could be a prophecy. Yay! I'm gonna rip out from you your perfectionism. Oh. And give it to your wife. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Okay, how do you get the mantle for the church? 1 Kings 19, 19. Now, in Genesis 37, 3, you wrote down Genesis 37, 3, and you wrote down many colors. And then out of 1 Kings 19, 19, you're going to wrote, write down threw his mantle on him. Sometimes God's tactic is that he gives you something before you know what it is, and then he keeps moving for you to catch up, because if he told you everything that that mantle meant, again, what it would take to get it, you might throw it right back. Boy, I have stories on the tip of my tongue right now, because there were times when God so tricked me God is just, and he's not a liar, but it's awful close sometimes, it seems to me. (laughs) Whoa, what are you talking? God says, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to exalt you, I'm going to make you the man, I'm going to say, yes. Oh, yes. But in between, I'm going to break you. No. No. So what happens? He throws things on the church before you even know, (laughs) before you even know how much multi costs. (laughs) It's good. Multi, ah, Shandai Rama, multi, multi, multi. I told you not to go too long. I deserve, I deserve that. I deserve that. God gives you vision without price tags because prices come through seasons and colors. If I would have known when God spoke to us about multi-site and church planting and, 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 I had no idea that meant give up my best leaders. I want to plant those who need to go. <laughs> right? I, I know exactly who I will plant. I've been trying to get them off staff for years, and this is my time. I'd see you going to Albuquerque. (laughs) Malta. It's costly. And if you don't own the initiation of it, you might want to get out when the pressure comes because you didn't buy it at the beginning got to bite at the beginning. There's a mantle for this church. And God's going to throw it on you. Good news is I've moved to page two. (laughs) 
let's at least define this word mantle. I, I think the word study on mantle, remember, we're talking about the mantle for the church, which I'm going to get to tomorrow, and I'm going to give you my whole take on it, oh, hopefully, you know, but we're, we're defining a Bible word that has an equivalent in New Testament terminology, okay? The word mantle comes from two Hebrew words, and if you put the two Hebrew words together, they're actually very interesting to follow, which we don't have time to do, don't need to do, so I'll just give you the slide right now that has the definition for mantle, which is the combination of these words, the, the word adur, adar, uh, all the Hebrew words used. Uh, the mantle is a powerful anointing and call that rests upon a church, because I'm talking about church, that's why I started with Revelation chapter 1, the seven letters to the churches, not, not to just the individual, to the churches. That rests upon a church to demonstrate God's majestic, superior, and magnificent glory and grace. So God puts a mantle on the church. While you're writing that down, I'm going to read some more. If you, you don't have to write it down, but... I think it's interesting, again, when you look at the Hebrew word, the two that's used most, it means majestic, superior, something mighty. It also means noble. It also means mighty ones. It's translated in Judges chapter 5, the mighty ones. That's the same word that's used for mantle. The, they were mighty mantles. They were mighty mantles. And they were rulers of the people. And they received an excellence. From God. Now, God wants to put a mantle, and it's not put like I'm going to throw it on you tonight or something, uh, because it's already there and it's being developed, but I want to acknowledge a piece of that, and as we get into it again tomorrow, I'll do that to talk about what is the mantle. This is the third main point now you're going to put down. You know, churches have destinies, and churches have God-made mantles, and then you're going to write down this third one, which will take up more. Churches have God-given grace. And grace is equivalent to this word mantle used in not the grace for salvation, but the grace for enabling, the grace for functioning with your gift to fulfill your calling. That's the grace I'm talking about. You function with a grace that fulfills your calling. All right? I'm going to take five more minutes, David, and I'll be done. Okay? Acts 4.33. I'm going to give you two scriptures from Acts, but in this final moment, Acts 4.33. Now listen to it. You know it. And with great power, write down and say out loud with me, great power. Great, great power. One more time. Power. And I want you to notice with great power, the apostles. Everyone say apostle. apostle. Sometimes we forget that they're in that book. Great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Lord Jesus. And it says in your Bible and mine, and great grace. Everyone say great grace. Great grace. Now, why would the Bible use the word great in front of the word grace and then say it was upon them all as a blanket, as a mantle, as a canopy? It, was, it landed on this group of people. And so this group of people had great magnificent enlargement, uh, not just a grace that, that uh, you would sense it maybe a certain kind of a church, but God was preparing this church to kick the devil right in the teeth. He's preparing this church to move from right there, the prayer meeting, to miracles and healing and preaching and churches in every city and, and missions and the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and, and the team and what's going to happen in Jerusalem, what's going to happen in Antioch and, and all that's coming. And so God puts a mantle on this group during the prayer meeting and it says it was a great grace mantle, powerful upon the people. The more power in the grace, the more power in the destiny. The more power the church has in grace. I, I, we get to go to churches literally almost every week in a different place. And we get to go to some of the greatest churches in the world. 
And we get to go to some of the most unknown churches in the world. In my estimation, are still some of the greatest churches in the world. But I'll tell you right now, in my estimation, grace on a church can be felt. And when you lose it and don't feel it, you know it. And you get nervous. And you begin to what? Substitute something. Let's get a new worship leader. Let's get a new band. Let's build a building. Let's get more light. Let, let's uh, uh, see. Uh, I think we need to get more film clips during the preacher. I think we need to uh, maybe when you lose the supernatural thing, you try to plug it with the natural. And grace, grace on a church, when you have it, there's nothing compared to it. And there's nothing you can do to replace it if you lose it. Some churches, in their foolishness, think that corporate grace belongs to their gifting. I'll say that again. That corporate grace, the mantle on the church, belongs to me. Why some pastors won't make a transition is because this is my church. This is my mantle. I built this place. Thank you very much. It's my great preaching. It's my great everything. And if I leave too soon, this place will just go by the wayside because my gift is what gives this place the grace. That I've watched so many of those guys when they moved with their gift and ended up leaving that church for whatever reason, the church actually got better. <laughs> Why? Because grace is not based on me. It's not based on a guy, a gal, a leader, a magnificent preacher. It is based on hungry hearts who are seeking God, building an altar, crying out to the Lord, building the church with the Holy Spirit, exalting the Holy Spirit. When I had cancer and was gone almost a full year from my pulpit, and I, I'm, I'm an amazing preacher. <laughs> I don't think I am, honestly. But I do what I do. And I had done it for many years from that pulpit. So I'm going to be gone a whole year, 11 months. No preaching at all. Not one squeak out of my mouth. All the teams, all the people. I thought to myself, what a great season for our church. Why? Because it was never built on me. Now, it will even be stronger because God will have to spread it even more. Sure enough, the church grew 10% in attendance and 11% in money. So when I came back, the elders said, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Have you thought about maybe staying a little longer? <laughs> they were kidding, and it was a joke. And we all knew exactly how we felt. Thank God for great grace. Thank God the church is not built on me or you or anybody else. It's built on the body of Christ and prayer and worship and grace that comes upon that church. Grace. Wow, God's grace was so powerful at work with them that they were shocked. Man, you can come to the platform. We're going to do a song. Is that what we're doing, David? Are we doing a song? No song. Okay, good. I mean, not good, no song. I mean, I, I, mean, you know, I, I like all the song people, but um, I'm talking about the difference in Acts 4.33 and Romans 12.3. That there is a grace that is not the grace of salvation. It's the grace of enabling. And when that comes on the whole church in a great way, the mantle starts getting woven together. All right? At page one and a half. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, whenever I speak, I will finish the other nine pages. 
I will give you at least the framework of it because that's my message. I'm going to Acts 11. I'm going to talk about the grace they saw. The grace they saw. They saw the grace. On Antioch, they saw it. There's nine things they saw. Now, they don't know there was nine, but I'm telling them there's nine things they saw that are on these kind of churches. All right, that's what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet. And I want us to truly, just for a moment, I know you've had a busy day, and there's a couple more things David will do tonight. But I want you just to stretch your hand toward heaven. And I want us to go on the Holy Ghost for like two or three minutes. If you don't know what that means, it means if you have a spiritual language, you're going to speak out loud and you're going you're gonna to speak with force. You're going to speak with force, not just mumble. And we're going to intercede in the Holy Spirit. Oh, we stretch out, we stretch out, we stretch out to you tonight, oh God. Oh, let the mantle of God come on this church and these leaders. Rosso to the Monday, the man that ever Baba Baba de la Manda de la Manda Rosso to the Baba Bo, Rabba Baba de la Manda Rabba de la Mende, Rabba Baba de la Manda de Baba Baba Holy Spirit of the Living God, fall upon this place tonight. Richolo to the Roman de la Mende Rosso to the Manda de Manda de Baba 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 Holy Spirit of the living God, supernatural, wonderful, let there come upon the church. Open up heaven, open up heaven. Open up heaven, oh God. Open up the wells. Open up the future, oh God. Oh, Rama nada rabo soto ho soto la mandele mende ho rabo bo 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 ho diri diri mundi di bandera bo 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 yes yes Yes. Oh, yes. He wrote in all of Monday. In all of soul. In all of Monday. The word of the Lord would come to this congregation where, yes, I am weaving together with the threads of sovereignty, the threads of supernatural capacity. I am sewing together a mantle, a mantle that you've dreamt about, a mantle that you've asked the Lord for, a mantle that you actually have no idea how wide and deep this mantle will go. But I will mantle this congregation and everybody out from this congregation will come under a mantle of the tunic of many colors 
and I will anoint each one of the seasons so that nothing will be wasted, nothing will be set aside and forgotten about. For you have been on a journey and you have paced yourself, but be warned that the Lord is going to increase the pace. He's going to increase the speed. He's going to increase the boundary lines are going to be pushed out. He's going to do far and above anything you could even imagine because my mantle is much greater. It is much greater than anything you could put your hand on. But this is a supernatural season, a supernatural time, and I will mantle every leader in the house, every weak leader, every double-minded leader, Leader, uh, every leader that says, I can't carry this. Uh, I don't have the strength for this. Uh, the Lord would say, I empower you with an impartation of the strength of God. And you will pick up the mantle uh, and you will carry it like you have never carried the mantle before. I will mantle every person. Stretch out to the Lord now. Every person in the room like you're, like you're going to put the mantle on. Reach out and say, I want to be mantled tonight for the church, not for me, the church with the Spirit, the Word, the miracles, and the harvest. I believe there's a mantling now reach and just put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you. And just kind of close up the gap or hold their hand, put your hand on their shoulder, whatever you want to do, just kind of close up the gap between. Because what I see happening right now in the spirit is that the Lord is closing up the gaps. Those that thought they'd be left behind are not going to be left behind. Those who have some issues, put them before the Lord right now because He's able to take care of those. For those who have lost passion, there's an impartation of passion with the mantle that comes on this place. Oh God, I pray for the mantle just to land. Lord, throw it on this people. Let it land on them. Let them shake their head in almost unbelief, saying, What has landed on us? Oh, God. Lord, let that manna rest on them. And do something mighty in the Spirit, in the Holy Ghost. Lord, we receive it right now. Come on, church. Let's give the Lord a huge shout and a huge clap. Who shall tell Thank you, Frank. We had a lot of great things to do right now. Just be seated for, but none of them fit. It doesn't fit. The only thing that fits right now is that we would just worship Jesus because something happened in this room. I don't know if you felt what I felt. It doesn't even matter if you felt it. I'm telling you, something happened in this room. Something happened in your life. Something happened in our church. Pastor Frank, that was amazing. Thank you. That was amazing. And when, and when Frank DiMaggio prophesied, he's, he's, not, he's not like a, an occasional prophesier. Uh, he's not a courtesy prophesier. <laughs> if he prophesies, you could take it to the bank. Something just happened, and I want us to worship the Lord. And um, what we're going to do is I would like to receive an offering. If you were here, if you, how many just arrived tonight? You just, and the rest of you guys were here through the day, right? Wasn't today an amazing, we had Jerusha Tanner. That word from Jerusha life, I feel like at the moment I thought, we could just close the conference, we're done. That was amazing. And then Eric Butler sharing the word and prophesying and moving in the Holy Spirit. And then tonight, 
Pastor Frank, and then tomorrow morning, Pastor Frank. We're going to be here at 945, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to receive an offering now to bless our guest ministers. The $15 or $20 that you paid uh, to register wouldn't even cover the food. But what we do want to do, what we do want to do is take care of these guests that have sown into our lives and strengthened us. So we're going to receive an offering tonight as we go out and worship. And as, as we're receiving the offering, uh, we're going to worship. <clears throat> if you're making a check, make it to Gateway. You can give on your credit card. You can use text to give however you want to give. Just market, conference, and everything that comes in tonight, we're going to use to take care of our, our guests because they have blessed us. They've left their homes. They've sat in airports waiting to catch their flight with noisy people around them and ended up with other people's DNA all over them in an airplane. It's just, right? Do you shower when you get off a plane? I do. I just shower. I just... But how many appreciate them being here? You appreciate that? Yeah. So Kathy and I are going to give, and uh, we'll, we'll receive another offering tomorrow morning in case there's others that want to give and weren't here tonight. Uh, I want to thank you for coming all the way that you've come. People have come here from... I want to have our team from Las Vegas, our friends from Las Vegas, Pastor Danny Han, Pastor Larry Han, Jeanette, Margaret. Would you guys stand up with... Celebration Church of Las Vegas, our new friends. Look at our new friends. Is this a beautiful group of people? We're family now. Yeah. So everybody that's come together, all our cities, all of, we're going to do some honoring tomorrow. But let's just worship the Lord with our giving, and let's sing for a few minutes. And then we're going to be dismissed to a massive reception. And we're going to party tonight. We're going to rejoice in the goodness of God. We're going to eat good foods. We're going to fellowship. It's going to be really special, so don't go anywhere. Let's worship the Lord. Father, thank you for this time to give, to honor you as we honor uh, those that you have sent to us to help us, to mend us, to equip us, to strengthen us. We receive it, Lord, and we know that we're never going to be the same because of this time in your presence and your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. I'll be right back in just a moment. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve all praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve all praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve all praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now. Above all names, be exalted now. Oh, as your glory, you alone, you're the name. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone, oh, you're the name. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve all praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve all praise. You're the name Sing worthy. above all Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, 
dismissing in 30 seconds here, but before we do that, we'd like Pastor David and Kathy to come up here on the platform. How many love Pastor David and Kathy? I know this is out of script. Come on up here. This is totally out of script. How many love our pastors, our leaders? So this is totally off the record. You didn't expect this. We didn't know when it was a good time. We just want to honor you both and say thank you. For the conference your integrity your love your leadership your vision your sacrifice you guys don't know all that goes behind the scenes to do this and just the continued passion of, of doing the work day in day out the faithfulness and so we're going to have some flowers here for you kathy and then we got you guys are going to go away for a couple of days for on a resort on a beach in California, somewhere. And tomorrow we're giving out the phone number of where they're gonna stay, so. <laughs> Be blessed, take a vacation a couple of days. Let's give it up for our pastor, our leaders. God bless. We love you guys. We love you very much. We love you both. Okay, go out the door to the your left, or your, yeah, your left all the way down to the warehouse. It's party time. We'll see you over there. God bless. <laughs>